Hi, this is David Tana Christiansen. Together with Langston Barrett and Samuel Jeleno. Hello! I've been working on a system for adding macros to languages with types. How does it work? Well, the language we've been making is called Klista. It features an ML style type system, which is to say it's got parametric polymorphism in a premix, prenex position, it's got data types, definitions by pattern matching, principal types, all the usual things you expect from ML. It's also got type-aware hygienic macros, which I'll get into the meaning of in a little bit. And it has a racket-style module system, which I won't really get much into, but we can talk about in the question period if you want. Uh, Klista is very much a work in progress at this point, but we think that it's made enough progress that it's worth showing the community at least. So what does the language look like? Right now, it has a highly parenthesized syntax, very much like that of something like Scheme. This isn't a fundamental aspect, though, and we could replace it with a more traditional ML-style syntax using techniques developed for a language called Honu, which you can look up if you want. But for now, we've got the parentheses. So the program example you see on your screen starts with a data type definition. So we're defining a data type called pair, which takes two type parameters a and b, and has a single constructor, also called pair, which takes an a and a b as arguments. If there are more constructors, then they just follow after the, after the definition of pair. Uh, we follow the AGDA convention of writing big things with big letters and small things with small letters, as opposed to the more typical Haskell convention where you have uh, you know, data types with capital letters and type variables with small letters. And then we have a definition of first, which takes uh, some pair P, and then pattern matches on P, so pattern matching is built in, and it gives you back the first thing, the, the X following the constructor pair. Devotees of OCaml or of recent versions of GHC with the, uh, with the Lambda case extension turned on might think, but hey, why do I have to name P? Well, you don't. You can also define the second projection this way. You could say, define second, lambda case, pair whatever y, and that gives you back y. On the other hand, unlike those languages, adding this feature to Clissa did not require changing the compiler. It's just a library. Here's what that library looks like. We can define macro lambda case, and then we, def we provide a function which transforms a piece of syntax into a new piece of syntax. And it does so in a monadic context, which is why there's a little bit more decoration there than you may be expecting. So the lambda case macro takes in a piece of syntax. It then does a case analysis on it using the syntax case operator, which is uh, so, sort of a less powerful version of Kent Dibbig's one for scheme. And we get a list, which is the lambda case keyword itself, which we're binding to underscore because we don't care about it. We know what we're defining, followed by some cases. And then we're going to return a quotation, or in this case, we have a back quote, which is a kind of quasi quotation of lambda x, case x, and then whatever the original set of pattern match cases are. Comma is anti quotation. Um, the, for those in the room who are more used to something like scheme, the back quote here isn't like scheme's back quote, it's more like scheme's syntax back quote, so the one with the hash mark ahead of it. And macros have the type syntax arrow macro of syntax. So macro here is a monadic context in which you can do many of the things that are useful during metaprogramming, like comparing identifiers by their bindings. Uh, we have a hygienic macro system, and what we mean by that is that uh, given that definition of lambda case, if I then go into a context where I've defined my own case macro, perhaps because I'm working in some EDSL or because I wanted to add some features that weren't in the default one, and then I've defined you know, a constant x to be 42, well, what happens then when I use this in this way, you know, where you've got lambda case of pair AB, and then we're going to compute X added to the product of A and B. Well, when we expand this, we see that there's an X and there's a case hanging around. And this case right here does not refer to the case I've just defined. Instead, it refers to the case that was in scope at the macro definition site. And this X right here is not captured by the X that was introduced by macro expansion. Instead, it's referring to the X that was in scope where I originally used it. So in other words, macro expansion neither captures variables nor causes its own things to get captured. These are sort of kept separate. And this makes it much easier to write correct macros. Um, hygiene really isn't an area of innovation in Klista. We're using Matthew Flatt's 2016 set of scopes model. There's the Popple paper binding a set of scopes. Um, you can sort of download it, implement it, and you'll get something very much like what we've got here. Um, nonetheless, we think it's important. 
Where we're trying to do our innovation is in making macros type aware. So one of the things available in the macro monad is the ability to ask for the type that the uh, piece of syntax we're producing must inhabit in order for the program to type check. So in this case, we've defined a macro called m. It's going to take a piece of syntax as its argument, which we're kind of ignoring here, and it then binds the current type to t, and then it does this type case operator on t, and if it's being used in a string context, then it's going to emit code, which is a string, the name of this workshop. Uh, I pronounce it tidy. I think some people pronounce it tied. I'm not sure which is right, but I'm going to do it my way. Um, and if the current context is expecting a pair, then it's going to emit the pair constructor with invocations of the macro for later expansion. So you get sort of a, a tree structure of pairs where all of the leaves are the string tidy. And this is going to be determined by the type you invoke the macro at. And if you use it at any other type, it'll just say, I don't have an overloading for that type. It's important to note that this type case operator is not a sort of a runtime case on types. Like it's not violating parametricity. Instead, the type case operator in a compile time program, which is in a meta program, is doing case analysis on the types of the program being generated, so the next phase. So a compile time meta program can analyze the types of, a, of the runtime program that it's in the process of constructing. Uh, an important property, once we start getting into types in ML, that you may be thinking about is the principal types property, which says that every program has a unique, most general type. Um, this is true, but it's a truth with modification, right? So actually, every complete program has a unique, most general type because, you know, if a program has a hole in it, if it's if it's not done yet, then we don't know which type variables we can generalize. We may be missing some unification constraints that will arise when the hole is filled, so on and so forth. Um, and not only that, it's actually every complete type correct program has a unique, most general type. And, and this is kind of a tautology, but um, you know, like, of course, the program doesn't have a most general type if it doesn't have a type at all. However, thinking about type errors is important to understanding a particular challenge that we've had to address. So let's say I define this data type called both, which is a homogeneous pair. So both projections have the same type inside of them. And then I invoke both on the string glue and the number two. Well, Clearly, this is not right because glue and two don't have the same type. But where does the error go? Well, one thing we could do is we could say the bug is on glue. And that's because the type checker decided to visit two first, which is its right to do. You know, it can visit things in any order, which is one of the wonderful consequences of the principal typing property. And, you know, we can say, oh, well, we, we wanted an int, but we got a string. Alternatively, we could say, oh, we wanted a string, but we got an int and blame the number two. There's been a lot of work on how to make these error messages more predictable and less sensitive to the internal implementation choices of the type checker. But this is the kind of thing you'll start getting if you do the standard undergraduate textbook implementation of ML. Um, similarly, we um, also want to avoid having implementation check choices from the type checker leak into our macro executions. In other words, just as, we, as, as it's nice and worthy of research to make sure that we're not observing type checker guts in our error message production, we also want to make sure that a change in the order of traversal of the type checker isn't going to cause our macros to start spitting out different answers. That would make it much more difficult to program with this system. So returning to our definition of the macro M, um, if we have these two invocations, what we really want it to be the case is that both of these should expand successfully, right? So both of hello and M, well, when we invoke M, we see that the current goal type is string. And so, you know, we're going to emit tidy. Similarly, with this M, we can see that the goal type is a pair. And so we're going to emit the pair constructor. And then in both of these cases, we can see the goal type is a string. So we emit tidy again. We get, you know, tidy, tidy, extra fun. Um, and I think also a good specification is that this particular expression should fail to expand. Or in other words, we should not get an expression out of it, which is both of M and M. You know, it may be in a context with forces its type, and that would be okay, but just alone as like a, the right-hand side of a top-level definition, we definitely don't want to allow this. And so what's happening here? Well, um, when we ask for what the current type is and we want to do a case analysis of it, there's not really any choice that we can take. So um, 
we want to we want it to be the case that any decision we make during type checking for the type of a particular thing is always forced by some piece of syntax and there's nothing here that's forcing us to make a particular choice you know if we start making choices for users then we'll get insufficiently general things and and we start having unpredictable results and it's much more difficult to use the system so how do we fix this problem you know how do we fulfill that specification our solution is something that Samuel has been calling stuck macros for a while. And, you know, the name stuck. So it's uh, in, in the case where we have both of hello and an invocation of the macro m, then the first thing, we're, well, if we're running m, we're going to do a type case and we see, yep, it's a string because, you know, the type checker is going left to right. And we've got some further cases. Um, you know, we pick the right case, the string case, and we emit tidy. And then it expands and we're done. In the other case, assuming we're going left to right, we hit M before we hit a string. What are we going to do then? Well, the type case operator sees the unsolved type variable, it gets stuck, and doesn't proceed. We capture the continuation and set it aside and wait for beta to be solved. Then we, you know, wait a little longer because, you know, type checkers sometimes have to go to do some work. And then it comes back and it's elaborated the string is great and solved the, the variable beta. And now we can do type case string as before, and we can emit tidy and get back tidy is great. That's sort of the basic intuition behind the stuck macro idea. Um, that also explains the strange name of our programming language. Uh, Klista is Danish for adhesive, and macros are getting stuck here. So what's an intuition behind why this works? Well, one way we like to think about it is inspired by Lindsay Cooper's work on LVARs. So, Really, type checking and macro expansion is kind of a problem of deterministic parallelism. In other words, the type checker could traverse the term in any order it wants, and we want to get the same answer no matter what. So we have an unpredictable interleaving of side effects. LVARs are a, a way of sharing mutable fields between multiple threads of operation, and they achieve determinism by equipping each of the fields with a lattice of values, and imposing the invariant that any mutations to the field can only move up the lattice. In other words, something can only be replaced by something else that's greater than it. Then reads from these fields block until a certain threshold value has been met, and then they unblock and continue. So the way that this relates to our system is that we can view our lattice as being the complete elaboration state of the program, with the original source at the bottom and the fully elaborated program at the top. And then um, the less than on our lattice, or the ordering, is represents like a step of increasing information as we elaborate the program. So it might be filling out an AST constructor, it might be solving a type variable, those kinds of things. Then our um, threshold read operation, like type case, that identifies a type variable, and anything um, above which above that type variable is where it's been solved, and anything below it is where it has not been. So like, let's say we've got our beta here, then our meta program is going to block in all of the orange states until we've solved for beta, and then it can continue. How do we implement that? So a traditional macro expander takes in your initial syntax and it, you know, finds a macro invocation, replaces it with what the macro returns, and then does that until there's no more macros left to a first approximation. That technique isn't going to work here because we need to be able to stop and resume and all those things. So what we do is we take a little bit of inspiration from the way you implement uh, an elaborator for a dependently typed language, and we have a program with holes in it. So we've got a, a, a meta variable, which is the dot, and a type meta variable, which is the alpha. And then we've got a queue of tasks that are going to be making progress through filling out these holes. And our first task is to expand the syntax both of hello and an invocation of that macro m. So well, both is a data type constructor, so we unify our type, and then, uh, you know, so now we see that we've got both of beta, where beta is a fresh type variable, and we're also realizing that our AST node is going to actually be an invocation of the constructor both. Now we create new tasks for our arguments, and because we're allowing it to go in any order, we arbitrarily get to have m first in the queue. And so how do we do m? Well, m is going to uh, execute because it's a macro invocation. 
and it gets stuck because we don't know what beta is yet. And remember, m has that type case inside of it. So now uh, we kick it to the end of the queue with a little note saying, you know, revisit me once beta has been solved. And now we have a string. Well, we know what to do with a string, right? We can unify the type with, with string, and then if uh, that works out, then we fill in the expanded AST. So our beta becomes string, and our hello goes into one of the subnodes. Um, and we're done with that task. Now we can unstick because our goal type is known, and we can fill out tidy into our slot here. So the key features of Klista so far uh, under its current status of development or its current level of development, first off, we have these type aware hygienic macros. The only other system we're aware of that has this is, or there's two other systems we're aware of that have this, which are Lean4 and uh, Alexis King's Hackett. So um, other systems will often have type aware meta programs. So my earlier work on Idris does this, um, but it doesn't have any macro hygiene. Agda is similarly. Um, or it'll have hygienic macros, but not type aware macros. So type racket, for example, doesn't, um, it, it just does all of the macro expansion and then type checks the resulting core language program separately. We have a predictable programming model that is based on sort of getting stuck as necessary and then unstuck when we can. And by predictable programming model, we mean, you know, that orders of arbitrary choices taken by the type checker shouldn't be observable to user programs or to user meta programs in this case. And we have this to an extent in um, in Lean4 and in Agda where you can block on a meta variable and wait for its solution. Um, and it'll then reinvoke your meta program from the start, whereas in our case it just re you know it blocks and then restarts again, but that's fairly similar. Um, most other systems, like my earlier work on Idris, for example, the order of the elaboration is very visible to meta programs. And, that makes it more difficult to use. Uh, we have no arbitrary locality restrictions for type information. So you could solve a type at the very end of the program, which unblocks a macro at the very beginning. Um, this tends to be a little bit uncommon. You know, a lot of systems take things one phrase at a time or something like that. Uh, we have a single language for metaprogramming and for programming. So once again, Lean4 has this. They're making, they're making cool stuff over there. And similarly, um, you know, Idris has this, Agda has this, Racket has this. Um, Hackett does not, but it could. So um, what doesn't have this is something like schemes, syntax rules, macro system. And then finally, where I think we're unique is we have this notion of fine-grained stuckness. So a macro can get stuck, and it can sort of sit there and wait, and and then it can get unstuck, and two macros can unstick each other and cooperate by providing each other with type information through unification. And I don't know of any other system that can do this, although you may be able to fake it using the commit operator in Agda's elaboration monad. So where are we going? Like, what's the next step? Well, first off, uh, we have an ongoing effort to implement higher kind of types, which Samuel has mostly been responsible for. And that'll allow us to re-implement a lot of Haskell language extensions as libraries. Hopefully we'll get a nice lab for testing Haskell language extensions much more easily than editing GHC. And, you know, so we can do things like error notation if we want. Uh, we also want to explore what features support the style of LVAR inspired programming. So we're thinking, for example, that a version of Metaperl's resource system could be used in order to add tables to modules, which could be extended and you, you know, you block and when something appears in the table, then you continue. Um, this might allow us to do type classes as a library. We haven't figured it out yet entirely. We also want to find sort of type-friendly ways to implement various Racket metaprogramming features. So Racket has this system of compile time bindings, for example, and we don't have a good way to give that a Hindley Milner type at the moment. So we'd like to find alternatives to it. Maybe that tables feature could support it. I don't know yet. We haven't yet um, got local expand working, so we can't invert control between the elaborator slash macro expander and a user metaprogram the way you can in Racket. But I think we have some interesting things to do there by treating it as an elaboration task that's witnessing some judgment rather than as just simply a syntax to syntax transformation. But we haven't totally worked out all the details yet. And then finally, I would really like to add some fancier types. You know, my my dream system is some sort of observational type theory or XTT or something with fancy scheme style macros. I think that would be a fun little minimalist language that was highly extensible. But um, we'll see if there's time. If you'd like to collaborate or if you'd just like to download Klista and have a go, 
then you can get it off of Samuel's GitHub at github.com slash jellysam slash Thank you so much for your attention. We really appreciate it.